Hi everyone, this is a video lesson for definition. It's also going to be a quick review of some key concepts, including how to uh, maneuver through your Moodle course. My hope is that this will get us all back on uh, track as we get back from the fall break over at McNeese and so that we're really engaged in the last few weeks of the semester. Uh, the papers that are coming up now are going to be worth quite a deal, quite a bit more points towards your final grade. Uh, they're going to start going up in value, so it's important that you really follow the instructions for these papers uh, and that you read very closely. So you see what I have uh, on the board here, on the video here, is a Microsoft Office document. Uh, I want you to look at this because I want to go back over with many of you how to set this up, how to actually set up a Microsoft Office document for, uh, let me clear that one out and make sure I have the right one up here. Uh, yeah, let's, let's delete that one. It's starting to freeze up on us. We're going to reopen that. As you know, sometimes technology doesn't work very well for us. Okay, here we go. All right, so we have a Microsoft Word document. Basically, uh, this is 2010, which is about midway between 7 and 13, and it's set up. It's pretty much set up the same way. Uh, the first thing I want you to make sure on all your Word documents that you've set the view and that you've clicked this little ruler box right here to make sure that we can see the rulers and then I want you to go in, some of you have this down but some of you are still turning in papers without page numbers make sure that you've double clicked up here, you found the page number in the header and footer tools top of page and it's going to be plain number three and then you type your last your last name and that should count the pages up on every paper that you turn in. Then you want to go in here and make sure your paragraph is set to zero, zero, and double. Uh, you probably can't see that box just yet. Let me pull that up for you. So there's the box. It usually pops up actually in the center of the screen more like this. And you need to make sure that you can see the zero, zero for the spacing and that your line spacing is double. And you'll click OK. And then that will disappear. Then you want to make sure also that your fonts are 12 point, Garamond or Times New Roman. And your header needs to always look like this. First name and last name. The title of your teacher and your teacher. The course section, which in your case is going to be 101 and then the are the class code and then your section will be either W2 or W3 and then you will want to put the date. Now some of you are still messing up the date. There is no punctuation in the date. It's a two digit day. Spell out the month. Four digit year. Okay. Now probably one of the main comments I made each time with the papers was that you need to actually come up with a decent title for your papers. A lot of the papers many of you are choosing to uh, give a title that is really just a restatement of the assignment and if you think about that that's a pretty boring way to start a paper. That's the first impression people, uh, people get when um, they read your paper is how is the title that's the first impression you give so if it's a boring title it's not going to intrigue your reader and that's one of the things you want to do if you don't intrigue your reader uh, chances are it's going to lead to a lower grade so uh, for this lecture which is going to be a combination of dealing with formatting and Moodle and all of that and also the act of definition uh, I want to come up with a cool title based on the definition rhetorical mode. And this is just to show you how to think through some of these concepts. So I'm actually going to uh, think up a title based on my reading. So if you turn to page 136 and you look at definition, 
uh, in the composition and rhetoric guide, the 2015 through 16 one, it says definition as a rhetorical mode is closely related to, but not the same as the dictionary sense of definition most people already know. As a rhetorical mode or tool, definition involves expanding an existing meaning of a word or attempting to change or argue against the accepted meaning of a term. Almost exclusively, when one writes an entire essay in the mode, the writer is dealing with connotative meanings rather than denotative meanings. All words have both denotative and connotative meanings. Dictionaries and other reference tools explain denotative meanings. So that's the first paragraph. It's pretty dry reading, if you ask me. So let's let's jazz it up a little bit. Let's make it a little more interesting. So uh, expand our horizons. Words mean more than. <laughs> Here we go. Corny reference to a 1990s, early 90s song. More than words. Extra credit to anyone who can email me the name of the band that wrote that song. It's a very cheesy song. So, there's my title. And you see how that was kind of fun and interesting. Uh, and uh, now I know I'm going to be talking about definition. I'm going to be talking about definition as a rhetorical mode. Uh, I'm intrigued into, uh, into the content of the essay. I'm going to art the lesson and I'm going to explore this concept a little more thoroughly. Whereas if I just said definition, yeah, that's kind of boring, right? So you want your writing to, to be interesting. You do want to play a bit with uh, your audience expectations. Okay, so earlier in the semester, I believe I posted a lecture video about formatting, but I'm going to go over some of these basic concepts again right now. Uh, there's a basic five paragraph format to any essay. Really five sections makes more sense than five paragraphs because five paragraphs is something middle school students do. You're college students. But you can think of your paper organized into five distinct sections. The first section is the introduction. The second section is the body section. And the reason the number usually equals five is the body section usually consists of three subtopics or subsections. And notice I'm using the term topics or sections because I want you to think of these things as possibly being more than three paragraphs. A minimum would be three paragraphs, but you might want some more. And that'll make sense in just a minute. And then you have your conclusion. Now each of these sections of a paper has a distinct role. The role of the introduction is to, of course, introduce the reader to the topic. One of the other uh, reasons for an introduction is to give background information. Establish the importance of the topic and this is where you deliver the thesis, which if you recall, the thesis has a distinct formula, subject plus opinion. Now, in your uh, division and classification papers and your exemplification papers, there was still a distinct lack of thesis statements. So I want you to really think about this uh, as you're moving forward. You need to take a position on your topic. So if you go back and you think about that first paragraph on definition, it says in here that almost exclusively when one writes an entire essay in the mode, meaning definition, the writer is dealing with connotative meanings rather than denotative meanings. And prior to that, it says, as a rhetorical mode or tool, definition involves expanding an existing meaning of a word or attempting to change or argue against the accepted meaning of a term. So right there, they're giving you an entryway into discussing this concept of definition. You will typically get some sort of term that is abstract, an abstract concept. Abstract words represent ideas and concepts, things like freedom, love, hate, democracy. These are abstractions. They don't really have 
uh, real world equivalents. They're ideas more than they are, you know, like a chair. A chair is a physical thing. You can't really point to democracy as a physical thing or freedom as a physical thing. So you're going to take one of these terms and you're going to argue against the accepted definition of it using connotation or you're going to approach that definition in a new and unique way. So that's what your thesis is going to do here. In the case of definition, I'm going to change the font color just for our purposes to set it off. In the case of definition, the student, ah, see, typo. The student will want to either challenge the accepted understanding of the term or expand upon that term's accepted definition. You'll want to go beyond. The student will want to go beyond the denotative and explore the connotative. Now, I've been using these terms denotation and connotation a lot already in the lesson. I've been using these terms quite a lot uh, because I want you to get used to hearing them and understanding them. Denotation, as it says on page 136, is the dic dictionary definition of a term, uh, what we think of as literal meanings of words, although I don't really like that adjective literal. Connotative, these are the s associations, inter interpretations, and feelings we have connected to a word. So when we are looking at specific words, we have different uh, feelings associated with words. Again, if I go in here, and I'm going to change the font color again just for you to uh, see it set off, and I type the word freedom as an example. Well, most people in the United States associate freedom with positive emotions, right? This is something we believe our country is built on, freedom of choice, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, freedom to be an individual, freedom to act how we want, to dress how we want, to believe what we want. However, some people might actually see freedom as a negative thing. Too much freedom leads to chaos. Uh, too much freedom allows people to make decisions that aren't necessarily the best for the rest of society. You know, if everybody is doing their own thing, then how can you work together to face a problem? So freedom actually might have a negative connotation. So these uh, may also have a negative set of emotions attached to it. So what we are talking about here is connotation. So it all depends on perspective. Now connotation is determined by a number of factors. Okay, So when we're thinking about connotation, when we're thinking about connotation with uh, defining a term, we need to Keep in mind that what a word means changes depending on a number of variables. So I'm going to actually clear that out because that makes more sense for those of you that are scientific minded. Uh, and these variables include, but are not limited to, uh, time, when the word is said, speaker, 
who is saying the word. Uh, and the speakers race or nationality play a part in it. The speakers age plays a part in it. Speakers audience can also play a part in how the word is being used or interpreted. Believe it or not, the speaker's religion and uh, worldview can also play a part. Let's change that to a word you might be familiar with, ideology. Okay, so also the audience who is receiving the word and the audience's race or nationality, the audience's age, I think you can see a pattern here, uh, the audience's total makeup, is it diverse or homogenic, homogenous. Okay, so in this case, sometimes we act differently depending on whether we're in an audience made up of people who are similar to us or an audience that is different than us. So the way we interpret words sometimes changes depending on the audience, we, the people within the audience within which we exist. So if you think about this, this this concept may seem difficult to grasp, but the way you interpret language and use language is different depending on whether you're hanging out with your friends, are in a classroom setting, are in a large group of people, say at a concert, at church. The way terms are used, uh, you don't necessarily react the same way uh, in those settings, and, and no one would expect you to react the same way every time. In fact, you do something called code switching within each of those groups. And then, of course, the audiences. Religion our ideology. A good example of this, since we're dealing with, uh, polit since we're in a political season and we're coming up on the presidential campaign, it seems like I'm always teaching this around a, a campaign of some sort. Uh, I'm going to do this a different color again so we can see it set off. An example would be the word socialism. Socialism is an abstraction, right? If you look in your textbook on 136, an abstract word represents ideas and concepts. A word can be both abstract and concrete. Take the word mother. It means a physical person. So in this case, socialism, we can think of this also abstract and concrete. It represents a concept, the concept of socialism, which uh, its actual denotation. Let's look that up quickly. It's always fun to look up this sort of thing. I would not never use a dictionary in a definition paper do not quote the dictionary in your paper but you can still use uh, like the definition as a jumping off point let me show you what I mean and there's Moodle you can see Moodle real quick but I want to continue this lecture before going over Moodle stuff uh, so socialism defined let's see what we get here a political and economic theory of social organization that advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. And This is from the Oxford University Press Dictionary. So you can see the definition there. And that's the denotation, the denotation of socialism. So for the time being, we can think of the denotation as being the community owns property shares ownership of property. Okay, so that's the denotation. 
and that's relatively unoffensive, right? Inoffensive. It, it doesn't bother m many people when you present that dictionary definition. However, if you say something like President Obama is a socialist, the connotation suddenly changes. It becomes threatening. It becomes uh, derogatory. It essentially means that Obama is anti-American. And the word socialist, which I'm going to bold now, right? Socialist becomes a label for other. You can take out President Obama if that offends you, although people call him a socialist all the time, and you can include Bernie Sanders, who is running for office right now, who says he's a democratic socialist. He actually calls himself a democratic socialist. Uh, so Bernie Sanders is a socialist. And what? why is this term threatening? A derogatory when this is all that it means which in a lot of cases this is already true right uh, you just wrote a paper about public spaces those public spaces are owned by the community a private space is owned by a private organization and isn't an organization or a corporation simply a group of people who share ownership of a company so oddly enough this term socialist is negative in our culture and yet there are so many elements of our culture that is already socialist. Um, so this is one of those instances where definition as a rhetorical mode has a lot of possibilities because when we hear socialism we think you know I can just write down some of the things here right uh, I'm gonna put it in red because red is a color normally associated with socialism right we think communism we think USSR. Y'all didn't grow up during that time, most of you, but we think uh, the Red Scare. We think Soviets, right? And on and on and on, and all the things related to the other, this frightening other. But the truth is, none of those things are tied directly to socialism and its denotation. All those things are connotative. And so when this label is thrown around, it's thrown around as a way to induce fear and to manipulate an audience. And notice who says it changes its meaning. If Bernie Sanders says it, it's positive. Uh, if, you know, Vladimir Putin were to say it, who's the president of Russia, everybody would freak out in the Western world. And in his world, you know, in, the, in Russia, less people would freak out because it's not as scary a concept. So this is what I'm talking about with connotation. Connotation is created by all these things, all these variables, and words change meaning drastically depending on these things, depending on these concepts. So hopefully that illustrates that really well for you. So, in your introduction, right, you're going to want to introduce the reader to the topic. Let's go to Moodle for a second. All right. Let me go back to the video here. And you can see, let's move that forward. So these are the notes, and I'm going to post these notes attached to where this video is. You can see the notes here. So your first step in the introduction is to introduce the reader to the topic. So now we need to go to Moodle. And I need to show you the prompt. So this is looking at 102, 101 W2, but 101 W3 is set up the same way. It applies to both of you all. And you should now be in topic four, topic four. And you're going to read this little handout on final exams that UNC gives their students. And then you're going to go to definition, 
and you're going to actually type this definition essay, uh, do this quiz based on your reading, and then type this definition essay into the box. You're not going to type it in Microsoft Word this time. I want you to type it into the box because it's going to be timed. But here is the prompt. Okay. So write an extended definition essay on a term, activity, phenomenon, or object. You may choose something you are learning about in another course, something you already know well, or something you are interested in learning more about. Below are some options, and these are some of the options. A key concept from an introductory course, psychology, sociology, or economics course, such as ethnocentrism, diaspora, or monopoly capitalism, sort of like what we just did with socialism. You can define a type of music, a type of television show, although I would stay away from this one because it's a little too easy, and an unusual sport or leisure activity. Remember that these things, these concepts here, need to be abstractions in order to give you plenty to write about. So let's just take one of these as a model. Now because I'm taking this as a model, uh, that means I would not want you to write about it in your actual essay. Okay. So since we're going to take this as a model, our first task, we're going to introduce the reader to the topic, reality TV. All right. So I want to give some background information. And this is pretty general knowledge. I'm going to start my introduction with something like a sentence like, uh, in the early 1990s, Americans became enamored with a new form of television, reality TV. Reality TV, uh-oh, let's see here. That's what happens when you type quickly. You got to go back in and clean things up. Okay, there we go. TV, reality TV is a bit of a misnomer. It means that the 30 minutes to an hour long broad uh, show is happening in real time. It is honest and it is recorded as it happens. But in reality, <laughs> notice the pun there, almost all of these television shows were scripted and edited to heighten drama or comedy. So now I need to establish the importance of the topic, right? So that's the next thing I want to do in my introduction. I want to establish the importance of the topic. I'm going to italicize that so you can see this as a model here for giving the background information. The importance of the topic. Why is reality TV important? Well, uh, as a cultural phenomenon, it is reality TV is still with us into the second decade of the 21st century. Right? So it is. I mean, it's still with us today. Shows like Keeping Up with the Kardashians and 
American pickers are popular and discussed often around water coolers before or during office breaks. And I'm just brainstorming, I'm throwing it together. So what we need to understand about reality TV is that there is no reality to it. And what I have here, this right here, is my thesis. That is my thesis. So that's what I just did. I delivered my thesis. I gave a subject plus opinion concerning the topic. So if I put these two sections together, I have a model introduction for a definition paper on reality TV. And it's really that easy a concept. Uh, it's really that easy to set up. So I gave background information. That's this part. Background information. This part is the importance of the topic. And this part is our thesis. This all here is examples of how to do definition and what affects a definition. Okay, so we've gotten all of that. Now we need to develop our body section, the body section of the paper. Now remember what I said here, that the body section is typically consists of three subtopics or subsections. And this you might have recalled in middle school. I'm going to go in here and bold this. You might recall in middle school uh, that when you wrote a thesis statement, they probably had you write something called a three-part thesis. That's, uh, you know, reality TV is scripted, edited, and uh, full of fake people. Something along those lines. Well, those three parts are supposed to be the topic sentences of your subtopics. So instead of doing that in your thesis statement, now you do that as your topic sentences. So we need to come up with three different ways of looking at reality TV that are unique. So in this case, to continue, we're going to have a topic sentence. And I'm going to highlight it in yellow so that you see how it's associated with this um, thesis statement. So my first body section is going to have topic sentence one and that is reality TV is scripted. Okay, so that's my topic sentence. The example, remember me talking about example, explain, and transition. Uh, I'm going to use an example from a well-known show. I'm going to think about using, I'll take this off of bold so it doesn't confuse us. I'm going to think about using uh, Pawn Stars. So an example of this is Pawn stars. On the History Channel. Pawn stars followed the daily activities of four men who ran popular pawn shop in Las Vegas, Nevada. These characters included the old man 
to have found it the shot. Rick, who is the old man's son and currently runs the shop. I can never remember Rick's son's name. I'm going to look that up. So if you're typing this or writing this in class, you're not going to have time to look it up. Like you'll only have 50 minutes to look this up and uh, and and use it. But in our case, we're going to look this up. Characters and Pawn Stars. And since this is a common show, uh, we can, yeah, there we go. Rick Harrison, Corey Harrison. I always forget Corey. Uh, Corey, who is who is Rick's son and pushing to take over more of the shops day to day business and Chumley who is Corey's childhood friend and the show's comic relief these characters inevitably mock each other, set up competitions per episode, and debate with each other over the value of merchandise. It is the interactions between these men that bring viewers back for each episode. Much of the drama surrounds individuals who come to the shop hoping to sell personal belongings and have a, an unexpected fortune on their hands. These items are often vetted before the show ever airs and the drama surrounding whether they are of value are not edited by the producers and directors to heighten that tension and suspense audience members drive on. So you see here I have an example where I talk about the history of the show, give a little background of the show. And then here, believe it or not, I, I, I give a very little, this is a very small explanation. Sometimes the explanation will be bigger than the example. And then uh, I have a transition that I've set up which is going to lead into, you guessed it, our next topic sentence two. And so I would come up with a second topic sentence, something along the lines like uh, reality TV is edited. And then I would come up with an example. Maybe my example this time would be Survivor, the television show Survivor, which you know had to be edited 
because frankly it's not that interesting watching people living in the wilderness uh, day in and day out. Uh, they had to heighten it and create these games. I would explain how editing makes the show watchable and then I transition into my next topic. And then my next topic reality TV shows feature character rather than real people. And then I could talk about something like uh, you know a show that had that was like that that had a lot of characters on it and they moved characters in and out uh, would be that um, that show with uh, where they go to the storage storage wars storage wars on a and E and they have some characters uh, that examine characters in this show. And then I transition into my conclusion. Now what is the purpose of the conclusion? A lot of people struggle with conclusions. I'm going to give you a page number in your textbook which deals with it. So if you look at if you look at the rhetoricians toolbox they give you some information here some different structures but if you look on page 98 in rhetoric and composition the section 2 page 98 they have some good information on writing a conclusion so 99 the conclusion is the end of an essay it should be very clear from the conclusion that your essay is ending uh, its primary goals are to one readdress the argument. So in this case, your argument is reality TV is fake. Then you also want to tie together your ideas or points. So in this case you would reiterate those. It's scripted it's edited and has characters as opposed to authentic individuals. And then you would want to uh, think of a closing statement. Now what I often talk about with this closing statement is it answers the so what question. And for me, I mean, if I wanted to talk about our topic that I've been using as an example, the so what would be uh, too many people assume that life is really what they show us on reality TV and some of its greater abuses and extremes have spilled over into informational media like cable news. This means that now our news media is adapting ideas from reality TV in order to get a larger viewership and that is dangerous because when ratings trump the true reality we are all in for false information or something along those lines. Remember I'm just drafting here. I'm I'm jotting down ideas, but that would be like a final statement. Notice the final statement is more than one sentence. Um, 
So let me pull that up actually because I see that the video did not pull that up for you. So you can actually see it again. Okay. So you looked with me on page 99 at closing statements. And this is the conclusion here. Let's make it a little bigger so you can see it a little better. This is the conclusion I came up with for our topic. Zoom up. About 125 should make it big enough that we can see. So you're going to transition from this topic here, topic sentence three, into the conclusion. You're going to readdress the argument. Reality TV is fake. Tie together the main ideas or points. Scripted, edited characters as opposed to authentic individuals. And then develop a closing statement that answers the so what question. Why is this information important? Now, for a definition essay, for this definition essay, since it's an in-class essay, you really do not have to cite anything. In fact, uh, I don't expect you to cite anything because it's a timed essay, which should be a relief. However, when you go to your next essay, your, I believe it's cause and effect for you all, it might be comparison. Uh, you'll want to uh, cite again, but this pattern will still be useful for you. So, let's talk briefly. You see I've pulled up the Moodle page. Let's talk briefly about this process again. So the next thing you need to do is download, go to this page, open this resource, and read about final exams and how those work, okay? How those work, how you can read them, how you can use them, how you can think about them. You can even print this out and what the goals of it are. Remember that one of the primary things I am looking for as a teacher while you are writing these essays is that you are reading the textbook and that you are reading the papers that I am assigning to you. So if I put something in here, that means it has a use. Some of you didn't even cite in text the previous articles, which is going to create, well, which created some problems for your essays and it's going to create more problems in the future. So after you've looked at that on topic four, you're going to go in and take this quiz on definition and this follows your reading. Okay. Now this is going to close in two days so you need to get that done pretty quickly. Okay. And you get ten chances on it. Then there's a grammar lesson uh, and a grammar quiz and then the definition essay. Now when you go in to take this definition essay you're gonna to get to preview it. You have 55 minutes and you need to type it directly into the box. So when you open it and you start your attempt, this is what it'll look like and you'll type directly in here. And I want you to as much as possible organize it in MLA, in that structure, but remember you don't have to cite. So try to do as much pre-writing as you can ahead of time. And then once you submit it, you'll see you can return to the submit if you still have some time left. Uh, you can submit all and finish, and that will be that. And then you can start working on the next module. And the next module is under topic five, and that will be looking at logical fallacies and looking at research and how to research properly because you're going to do your own research and starting to develop this cause and effect paper which you're going to have a lot of time to work on because research is time intensive uh, and I will try to post another video lecture before then but if I don't there's plenty of information there for you. Now another thing I want to recommend as I said I'm going to uh, post this document here uh, is going to be attached underneath this video with the lesson. But another thing I want to recommend is that meant that you all start going to, if you're on campus, start going, I'm going to roll this up here, start going to the Right to Excellence Center in Drew Hall. It should still be in Drew Hall. I used to go there myself 
I was a student uh, at McNeese. Uh, I've also used the Writing Center. It is a fantastic resource for you, and it's one that I can tell many of you would benefit from. There is no shame in going and getting tutoring, getting someone to help you look over some of these concepts. So let me pull up their web page for you. If you have not been there yet, I highly recommend it. Their job is to make you a better writer. So here you go. This is the web page. It has the hours. It has all the information, how to set it up. Uh, it has a contact, an email, and a place to leave them feedback. Uh, it looks like they are still in Drew Hall, room 234. So that's, that's the second floor of Drew Hall. Uh, please, please go and take advantage of that resource. It is a fantastic resource. Another thing I want to remind you about, because it is clear from your papers that many of you are not reading, you do have this reading calendar posted. Uh, for this week, you need to have read CRG 136 and 191 and a writer's resource 439 through 47. And that's going to be, appear on that quiz. All right. You have to review a lot of these concepts throughout the semester as well. And a writer's resource, that's AWR, you need to be looking at that MLA tab for all of your citations. Everything you need to know about citing an MLA is in that book uh, under the MLA tab. It is extremely easy. All it takes is a few minutes to go through it and match it up. Uh, many of you were still making citation mistakes uh, despite uh, having access to that book. If you've purchased the book like you were supposed to, you will have it. So I do expect you to use those books. It is going to start reflecting more heavily in your grades, the format and the structure. I'm actually going to go to a different rubric for the definition paper, something a little more clear, I think than what I've been using. I've been using a standard rubric uh, used by the college and I want to try to use something that uh, I've actually developed for you all that I think will work better online. Uh, the, the results the same but it'll emphasize some of the issues that are important in academic writing I think a little more so now that you understand some of these basic concepts. So as always uh, please email me any of your questions about the actual essays and writing. Uh, Hopefully this will get us back on track for the semester, and I hope that it was a good refresher. Uh, and I hope to hear from all of you uh, concerning papers so we can actually uh, improve some of these papers because we do have some work to do there. Uh, and I hope that you'll take advantage of the Writing Center. Uh, again, the Right to Excellence Center in room uh, 234 in Drew Hall. You see the hours there, the 30-minute sessions are so much, uh, so helpful. I, I can't overemphasize how much they will improve your grade. So uh, have a good uh, fall break and continue this work. Uh, enjoy the rest and I will be probably talking with many of you via email.